before introducing our first speaker, Lord Dodds of Duncairn, I would like to put on the record the Bruges Group's appreciation of the work and dedication of Arlene Foster. Arlene addressed the group on a, a number of occasions, lastly at the 2019 conference of the Conservative and Unionist Party. Her support for Brexit and the integrity of the United Kingdom were undaunting and her contribution to the national debate will be gr greatly missed by the Bruges Group. Today we have the privilege of being addressed by Lord Dodds of Duncairn. Nigel was an outstanding leader of the Democratic Unionist Party in the House of Commons. The parliamentary DUP was the truest of the true under Nigel's leadership and the government should now regret rejecting their advice to drop the Northern Ireland Protocol. Ladies and gentlemen, Nigel Dodds. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr Chairman. I hope you can all hear me uh, loud and clear. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, join you this afternoon. Um, and, and, and once again, to have the opportunity to address <clears throat> this distinguished uh, group of, of, of people who have joined us um, this afternoon. And uh, I well recall the last time that I think I, I addressed a meeting of the group. Uh, it was uh, in a, it, 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 when we were able to gather together uh, physically in London. And I hope that those days will not be long uh, postponed. That we'll be able to all meet again in person. Um, that was, of course, at the height of the uh, discussions and negotiations uh, or, uh, in terms of uh, Brexit, uh, and a lot of water has passed under the bridge since then. Uh, but uh, can, can I just, by the way, thank you for your kind words about Arlene Foster as well. Um, uh, I think that uh, she has contributed enormous amount to um, trying to move Northern Ireland forward and to move unionism forward. Um, I have, uh, I, 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 many of you will have been following the news rather closely uh, and will know of the events of uh, yesterday uh, in terms of the uh, new leader of the DUP who has now uh, departed. It's all terribly uh, unfortunate and obviously I'll not go into uh, too much detail. Suffice to say that I think uh, this provides the opportunity for the DUP to move forward now in a more constructive way, building on our uh, approach and, and, and with a, a hopefully a leadership that will engage with unionists throughout the United Kingdom uh, to cement and strengthen the union. That, that has to be our priority. And to do it in a way which gathers as much support across the communities in Northern Ireland for the union, not just focused on, on one side of the community, because there are many people who may not be voting for unionist parties, but if it came to a referendum, wish to remain in the United Kingdom. And our task is to ensure that those people uh, become so uh, uh, enthusiastic for the benefits of the union that they will vote for unionist parties in order to ensure that keeps uh, keeps happening and, and that, that the union is maintained. So uh, we're, 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 we're in difficult times in Northern Ireland at the moment uh, in terms of devolution, but I think we'll be able to, to work our way through those. But one of the contributory factors to the instability in unionism in Northern Ireland politics generally and in the assembly has been the imposition of the protocol. Uh, people say it's, it's because of Brexit. I don't agree with that. Northern Ireland had the right, along with every other part of the United Kingdom and the citizens of Northern Ireland to express their views on a national question in terms of the United Kingdom's relationship with the European Union. Uh, yes, uh, a, a majority, not a massive majority, uh, voted in Northern Ireland to remain as other regions of the United Kingdom in some cases did. But we were voting in a national referendum and a significant number of people, mainly unionists, but a significant number of people who are nationalists also voted to leave the European Union. And, and our position has always been in the DUP 
that whatever the form of Brexit, whether it be the so-called soft Brexit or hard Brexit so-called or any of these descriptions and any uh, relationship in between, that Northern Ireland should leave and should be in the same position after Brexit as the rest of the United Kingdom. So therefore, there can be no border customs or regulatory in the Irish Sea between the, the rest of the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. And that has been our basic position. Um, looking back at the situation that pertained under the May government, people tell us now that the DUP should have accepted the backstop that Theresa May negotiated, uh, the UK-wide backstop, because that would have meant Northern Ireland would have left on the same terms as the rest of the United Kingdom. And it's always worth just having a correct historical perspective and understanding of the situation. That is not an accurate description of what was on offer. Uh, the Theresa May backstop was uh, something that could not be supported, certainly by anyone who believed in a true Brexit, because it, uh, it, it kept the whole of the United Kingdom fettered to a customs arrangement which only the EU could allow the United Kingdom to depart from. But it also created a regulatory border in the Irish Sea for manufactured goods. So we would have had the same protocol problems that we have today under her backstop, albeit that she was offering that she would align the whole of the United Kingdom with EU rules in those areas that affected Northern Ireland in order to prevent a plethora of checks. Now, since she made that offer and she was already on the way out of office and, and knowing that no self-respecting government would possibly tie itself in such a way to EU rules, uh, that wouldn't have lasted more than half an hour of, of any new uh, uh, administration. Uh, we knew that that was not something that was tenable. Uh, and the fact was that Northern Ireland was in the EU Customs Union and uh, in regulatory alignment on manufactured goods with the rest of the EU in an international treaty. And therefore, in principle and for practical reasons, the backstop was utterly unacceptable. Um, so I just want to uh, put that you know on the record because there's a lot of nonsense talked on the mainstream media and and lazy journalism, lazy analysis about what what happened. Um, in terms of we come on then to the Boris Johnson government and uh, you know we worked alongside uh, Boris Johnson to try to get Brexit done uh, and uh, unfortunately, we ended up in a situation, of course, he was dealt a very difficult hand. I accept that. But we ended up in a situation where the Northern Ireland Protocol was, was agreed. Uh, um, that protocol has caused enormous uh, damage both to the constitutional position of Northern Ireland and its economic situation. And I'll come on to both those aspects in a moment. I want to make it clear that the government is saying now that they didn't quite understand or believe that the EU would apply the protocol in the way that it has. Now, I understand where they're coming from in saying some of that. It may be that the government believed that there would only be checks on goods going into the European Union through the Irish Republic and that everything else would not be checked coming into Northern Ireland, for instance, the famous Sainsbury sausage issue, which uh, checks are now done on products coming, or would be if the grace period was ended, on products coming to Sainsbury's uh, uh, supermarkets, even though uh, there are no Sainsbury supermarkets in the Irish Republic, and they can only go to Northern Ireland. Uh, so there is an issue about how heavy-handed the checks are, but I have to make this point that the government knew full well the possibility of these uh, rules being applied in such a way by the European Union, not least because we know the history of the European Union and how it operates as a legalistic monolith. 
We know their attitude politically uh, in their attempt to bind Northern Ireland and, if they can, the rest of the United Kingdom as closely as possible to their uh, rules. Um, therefore, it should have been no surprise. And when you look at the legal text of the protocol, uh, and it's not that long um, in, in its main provisions, it was very clear that EU law would apply uh, directly in Northern Ireland. And, and therefore, I don't accept the argument that this has taken the government by surprise or that they shouldn't have known. They did know, not least because we warned them privately and we said so on the record in the House of Commons. Uh, and that's why we voted against it. We warned about the consequences. And I, I, I feel that uh, Northern Ireland, and I'll be frank here, has been badly let down by a Conservative and Unionist government. Uh, and. Uh, you know, we want to acknowledge in many other areas um, the work that's been done to try to repair some of it. Uh, and I wish David Frost well with his work, but we should not have been in this position in the first place. And then coming on to what is the problem? Well, the problem with the protocol is twofold. First of all, there, there's the constitutional and democratic problem. We now have a situation where in part of the United Kingdom in the 21st century, swathes of laws affecting the economy of part of the United Kingdom is made by a foreign institution over which no one in Northern Ireland, either elected to Stormont at the Assembly or elected to Westminster, has any say or any vote. That is an unconscionable position to place citizens, free citizens of the United Kingdom. Um, the democratic mechanism that was inserted into the protocol of which much has been made is that, oh, well, in 2024 and every four years thereafter, the assembly can vote. But the government changed the voting system without any consultation or agreement by the parties in Northern Ireland. The voting system in Northern Ireland in the Assembly, whether you like it or not, <laughs> some of us don't like it, but is that for every major decision of any significance whatsoever, there has to be cross-community agreement, a majority of unionists and a majority of nationalists. Clearly, all nationalists want to keep the protocol because they want the binders to the European Union as much as possible. At least their elected representatives do, whatever their voters may think of some of that. So the government changed the rule to ensure that we could never pass a, a, a law or pass a vote in the assembly, which would rid us of this protocol. Now, again, that was a very cynical uh, move, which we uh, opposed at the time. And it needs to be rectified to bring that vote into line with all other major significant votes in the assembly. We have a situation where this constitutional problem has been crystallized recently in a court case taken by the former Brexit MEP Ben Habib and others, including Arlene Foster and unionist leaders of other parties and Baroness Hoey. Uh, and that case is ongoing, challenging the protocol that it's contrary to the act of union. The government has admitted in court and argued in court the Act of Union has been impliedly, in part, repealed by the Protocol. This, again, is something that strikes at the very heart of the Union. It is a massive constitutional and political issue. And the government and others cannot argue that this does not change the constitutional position of Northern Ireland in one forum and then go into a court of law and argue exactly the opposite. Never mind the fact that all of this has been done without any agreement, vote or consent by anyone in Northern Ireland. Coming on then to the other aspect of the protocol, which is so detrimental, leaving aside the massive constitutional issue, is the tr are the trade issues. And those have been well rehearsed, the checks on things like pets, 
for rabies and other diseases which haven't existed in the British Isles for decades, and yet we're forced to have these checks on parcels coming into Northern Ireland, on foodstuffs, tractors weren't able to be imported because uh, we were told that it had British soil on it, which might contaminate the single market. We have ludicrous examples. Uh, the sausage war that has been well trailed, it may seem trivial and, and, and somewhat re reminiscent of Yes Minister, but it goes to a deeper issue that Northern Ireland consumers and citizens are being denied the right of free choice to access goods that they've had access to in the United Kingdom for decades. And that is not something that can be sustained. Um, could I, could I, and I've spoken long enough, I'm happy to take questions uh, later, but what I could sum it up with this is, this is such a deep political and constitutional problem, as well as an economic problem, that it won't be solved simply by the extension of grace periods. It won't be solved by tinkering with the level or the heaviness of checks. It will only be dealt with by a comprehensive replacement of the protocol, which removes the direct application of EU law in Northern Ireland for customs and for single market purposes, and which restores the right of lawmakers in Northern Ireland both locally and at Westminster, to make laws for Northern Ireland, part of the United Kingdom. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for that excellent analysis, Nigel. It's, uh, it, it's most welcome in terms of clarity and, and, and the comprehensive view you've given of the issues we face. Now, our next speaker is Bernard Jenkin. Bernard is chairman of the powerful House of Commons Liaison Committee on which all select committee chairmen sit. Previously, he was chairman of the Public Administration Select Committee and Shadow Secretary of State for Defence. For nearly 30 years, Bernard has been a prominent and articulate critic of our relationship with the European Union. At Bruges in 1989, Margaret Thatcher set out a vision for Britain as an independent sovereign state cooperating with its European neighbours. Three years later, Bernard and I, as new members of the House of Commons, were faced with the reality of Maastricht, a power grab by the European Union at the expense of independent nation states. And today, nothing has changed for the European Union. The Northern Ireland Protocol as we have just heard from Nigel, represents a power grab by the European Union against Britain's emergence once again as a truly independent sovereign state. Ladies and gentlemen, Bernard Jenkin. Well, thank you very much, Barry. <clears throat> once again, it's a great pleasure to be under your chairmanship at one of your meetings. There haven't been nearly enough of them <clears throat> in recent months, but. Um, I think the pace is hotting up once again, and uh, and well, I remember those days uh, where you showed um, incredible strength and principle um, at the, at the, during the dark days of Maastricht, and um, how the days got darker as we went on. But, uh, <laughs> we we, we got through in the end, and it's a great uh, privilege to be on the same platform as Nigel Dodds. Uh, I don't think we can really imagine the agonies that Northern Ireland is now going through and the, yeah, yeah. And, and the real tragedy that so much that has been gained in the peace process through the Good Friday Agreement is now being put at risk by the intransigence and a, a combination of British incompetence and EU intransigence. Uh, there can be no other way of uh, uh, looking at it, though I've got great faith in um, Lord Frost uh, that we are now approaching this in a uh, principled and pragmatic way. Um, and um, with a majority of 80, there's no excuse for not doing that. Uh, but I think we will begin to see the benefits of doing that. And maybe the EU has started to fracture uh, a little bit. Uh, they don't seem ready to confront the notion that we will be suspending grace periods for uh, another three months, uh, the, the ending of grace periods for another three months. I think they are beginning to see 
uh, that the world will judge them uh, if they elevate the Irish protocol, um, the Northern Ireland protocol, um, uh, to, um, to a totemic significance that is more important than the Good Friday Agreement, uh, the world will begin to judge them differently for the way they're behaving. But I just want to look at um, uh, the exam question you set about Brexit and the Union um, and look at more at the Scottish context, though equally it applies to um, uh, Wales and indeed to the way the debate is um, uh, framing in Northern Ireland. Um, is Brexit the foremost cause of tensions which threaten to break up the United Kingdom? Well, you think so from the narrative in the media. Uh, but what tensions have arisen from Brexit are merely uh, tensions arising from transition. They are not permanent. Had we remained a permanent member of the European Union, uh, that would have represented a much greater and permanent threat um, had we not voted to leave. In a recent interview in the Financial Times, Tom Devine, a famous Scottish historian and independent supporter, said, I've always thought that England would destroy the Union. The history of European Union, European multinational states, shows the rot steps Start, tends to start from within. Now, Tom's a great historian. Among his many achievements is rehabilitating the legacy of Thatcher in Scotland. However, in this case, I fear he's making a gross simplification. Uh, separatist movements in Britain have a long history, and in the 20th century, this history cannot be separated from the European Union, which, um, uh, though people forget, we were only in the European Union for under 50 years, which is not much out of a thousand years of constitutional continuity, um, but it is an awful lot in the lifetimes of most people. And, um, uh, and, and it is the entire lifetimes of many, many people, if not a majority of the people. So it's had a huge influence. So where does, let's talk about the concept of ethno-federalism. Now the writings of Guy Held, a 20th century French politician and lawyer, actually remain influential in continental Europe but not being available in English, are less well known here. He was a European federalist writing in the 60s and 70s, and he painted a vision of a future of Europe by linking federalist theories to the movement for regional self-determination. In L'Europe des Ethnies, uh, the Europe of Ethnicities, Evold lays down the principles of ethnic federalism. The basic principle is the right of every ethnic group of self-determination. Cultural affairs, the media and education will be managed separately by the elected representatives of each ethnic group. Economic affairs will be managed jointly by a federal Europe, Europe des Régions. In the short section on Scotland, Eld acknowledges that objectively the Scots are not a nation. It's a quite controversial thing to say these days. Linguistically, the evidence for nationhood is poor, he said. Um, I, I respect Scotland as a nation, let me just clarify. But subjectively, However, he notes, Scottish nationalism is more advanced than many other regions. Scotland does not figure among the 17 regions in Contre les Etats, les Régions du Europe, Herod's last book. Herod advocated an upward and downward devolution of power from the national governments, up from the level of the nation state to a European federation, down to what he called the natural regions within the nation states. Sovereignty for Herod was what enables nation states to evade their responsibilities in European affairs. Ha! Huh. He therefore opposed some nationalist movements within Europe, lacking a clear federalist agenda. They merely wanted to obtain sovereignty for themselves. Uh, I thought that's what uh, nationalism was about. Um, treaties. The Treaty of Rome echoed some of the federalist rhetoric. The European community would work towards Quote, harmonious development by reducing the differences existing between the various regions and the backwardness of the less favoured regions. Not much was achieved in practice until the first enlargement. The European Regional Development Fund was established in 1975. It is usually seen as a budgetary trade-off between large CAP recipients and the new net contributor, Britain. But the size of the fund increased significantly, significantly during its first years of operation. The growth rates were between 32% and 62% each year until 1982. Then we had the Single European Act uh, in 1988, uh, which brought in the structural funds, the European Regional Development Fund and the European Social Fund, uh, the guidance section of the European Agriculture Guarantee, which had a regional element to it. 
This reform involved a doubling of the funds spent on regional policy over the next five years and the establishment of new procedural links in the Commission between running of sectoral and regional policies. Subsequent developments, uh, especially those leading up to the signing of the Maastricht Treaty in February 1992, have reinforced the interrelationship between region and Europe. And just to cut a long story short, it was the Treaty on European Union in the Maastricht Treaty that established the Committee of the Regions, uh, Article 198 now of the Treaty on European Union, where sub-state actors can participate in the Council, uh, reinforcing the direct relationship between the EU and the regions, completely bypassing the national parliaments. The regionalization of Europe was only ever partial, uh, but significant. Budgets, the, the budget settlement remained a national, uh, uh, nation by nation negotiation. But regionalism created legitimacy for nationalist movements and an illusion of an EU safe haven outside the region's host state. And it's commonly argued that the, in Scotland, that the battle against Scottish nationalism cannot be won by hard economic facts. Uh, they alone will not win, but they are crucial. And as we leave the Union, European Union, they become much more crucial. So leaving the European Union, I would submit, actually reinforces the strength and unity of the United Kingdom, the interdependence of the parts of the United Kingdom. The think tank These Islands, and I recommend you look at the website if you're interested in this debate, found that 57% of Scottish independent supporters agree with the statement, quote, the figures used to calculate Scotland's deficit uh, are made up by Westminster to hide Scotland's true wealth, unquote. And 90% of them considered the statement to be important or very important. Now, if the SNPs basing their uh, uh, support for uh, independence on such false notions, uh, there is work to be done to correct this, these misapprehensions. The reality of Scotland's deficit position is shown in the Government Expenditure Review Scotland, known as GERS, the figures published by, and the figures are published by the Scottish Government. These figures qualify as national statistics and are compiled by the Scottish Government's own statisticians and economists. Scottish nationalists understate the importance of trade with the rest of the UK and overstate trade with the EU. In 2017, 18% of Scottish exports went to the EU, 22% to the rest of the world, interestingly, but 60% to the rest of the UK. So the myth uh, that economics don't matter uh, in part can be traced back to the flawed devolution settlement. However, the role of the EU structural funds and the influence they have had over uh, the debate in Scotland cannot be understated. Scotland is not a particularly poor region in European terms. In fact, uh, Scotland would be a net contributor to the EU budget were it an independent member state, something they probably haven't considered. Uh, but its GDP per capita is only slightly lower than the average of the EU 27. Ironically, due to the continued prominence of national governments in the allocation of EU budgets, Scotland receives a lot of money from the European structural funds, the European Social Fund, the European Regional Development Fund, but they would still have to contribute more than they put in as the UK uh, uh, did as a whole. Under the EU's 2014-2020 budget framework, Scotland was allocated uh, some 944 million euros in structural funding to be used. E EU funds needed to be match funded with domestic budgets, um, structural funds are EU-wide, but as, a, as the managing authority, the Scottish Government played a key role in directing funding in Scotland and so was able to take the credit for it. Part 6 of the UK Internal Market Act 2020 allows the UK ministers to operate what will become the United Kingdom... Uh, I've, um, uh, uh, I've forgotten the, what it stands for. I wrote it down a minute ago. SPF. Um, this is very annoying. Uh, share prosperity fund. Uh, it'll come, it'll rattle off our, our, our lips in future. The UK share prosperity fund in Scotland will be administered by UK ministers with no formal role for the Scottish government. And the UK share prosperity fund, heads of terms, does not define a management role for any devolved administration. I mean, yes, it is designed to create, to recreate the direct relationship uh, between the citizens 
of all the United Kingdom and the United Kingdom government wherever they live. And in fact, um, not a whimper did we hear an objection to the city deals in Scotland announced by George Osborne um, in the first half of the last decade and uh, when he was chancellor, because how can the SNP possibly object to the United Kingdom government giving them money? Um, an independent Scotland, as I said, would still be a net contributor to the EU. Uh, Brexit and the UK Internal Markets Act can make this calculation clearer. So the relationship between Europe and the SNP is understudied. Until the 1980s, the SNP was Eurosceptic uh, because Jim Sillers first adopted the position independence in Europe. Uh, the arch prosperity of rhetoric where Scotland looks to Ireland, Norway and Iceland as a model for post-independent Scotland is still politically powerful if economically spurious. But it must be challenged. Jim Sillers actually voted for Brexit in 2016. Uh, maybe, I think he's one of those nationalists that Monsieur Elwood did not like. I think the EU is a profoundly undemocratic organisation which has shown a callous disregard for people in, in Portugal, Spain and Greece, for example. They've been willing to make people destitute, beggar nations in pursuit of a single policy to create a United States of Europe, irrespective of whether the people want it. Here, here to that. Now, I could say more about the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, but I think you probably heard enough from Lord Dodds uh, and his perspective on that. I would just say that um, the European Research Group, where I chair the steering committee uh, every week in Parliament, of the key members of Parliament, have worked up uh, a perfectly reasonable alternative, uh, which doesn't require uh, the EU to exercise sovereignty in Northern Ireland over the regulation of goods. It's a system of mutual enforcement. And all that means is the United Kingdom government will guarantee that there will not be a flood of non-compliant compliant goods crossing the border into, North, into the Republic of Ireland to compromise the integrity of the EU single market. But what's more, we will guarantee to do that without, uh, restrict, without erecting any infrastructure on the border between the North and the South of Ireland. These were proposals that we tabled in a different form uh, while Theresa May was still pri Prime Minister, no sooner had we published our document, within seconds it was being denounced uh, um, uh, when they couldn't have, couldn't have possibly had uh, the opportunity to read what it said. Uh, the fact is that the government then was locked on the wrong course and Boris Johnson, for all his faults in this, can be excused from finding himself boxed in with no majority uh, in the autumn of 2019. It's the protocol that actually goes against the Good Friday Agreement, as Nigel Dodds pointed out. And um, as I've been suggesting to European diplomats in London over the last few days, uh, which is more important, uh, sticking to the Northern Ireland Protocol as it is, or recognising that the Good Friday Agreement is actually more important, and if we can find something better than the protocol to preserve the, United, the unity of the United Kingdom, the integrity of the EU civil market, the Good Friday Agreement, then we should be looking to those alternatives. And they were actually presaged, if I may say so, in the, um, in, in the original withdrawal agreement. Uh, it, we were going to look at um, alternative systems. Uh, the, there was the prospect of the Northern Ireland Protocol being superseded. Uh, the EU was meant to negotiate all this in good faith. I leave it to you to judge whether they have done so. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that, Bernard, and all the thought that went into it. And we will, in fact, publish a full text of your address on, on the website so that people can properly appreciate uh, the ideas that you're advancing and the analysis. Thank you. Um, it's to be welcomed that our movement is constantly renewing itself and new advocates of our cause are coming forward. Today, uh, it's the turn of James Weber of Sherman and Sterling. James is a partner in the antitrust practice in Brussels and London. His experience is very broad, covering merger control, state aid, and advising on UK market investigations and studies, as well as counseling clients on ongoing antitrust and competition matters. James, who advises the European Reform Group, has recently given evidence to the House of Commons International Trade Committee, describing the provisions of the Northern Ireland Protocol as 
genuinely extraordinary and completely unworkable, requiring to be replaced as a matter of extreme urgency. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome James here to address us. Over to you, James. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it's a great honor to be able to speak to the group and of course to follow uh, Lord Dodds and Sir Bernard uh, in their extremely uh, well-informed uh, commentary that we've, we've, um, we've had the benefit of hearing. I think my remarks uh, reflecting perhaps my role uh, so far in, in Brexit uh, are going to be legal mainly. I, I shall try and sort of make it accessible nonetheless. I mean, this, this, these materials are legally quite complicated, but I wanted to really do two things. One, to explain the legal realities of the protocol, because it, I don't think you can properly think of the alternatives or properly really understand the situation that um, Nigel described and, unless you accept um, the legal reality of, of what the protocol does. Um, and so the first part is not really a political summary, it's just a legal summary of, of, of you know, what the position is in law. <clears throat> and then the second part is really building on Bernard's point on this concept of mutual enforcement, which I've been working on um, for, um, well, a few years now. Uh, and, and how that how that would work. So a little bit of a more detailed explanation, because of course the first challenge to criticising the protocol is what do you replace it with? So mutual enforcement is what we can replace it with, and I'll explain how that the mechanics of that works. So the first half then. So the legal realities, and I, and I think um, you know the, the first point to make, and it's obvious, but it somehow seems to get lost in the political debate, yeah. is that. The protocol sets out binding legal obligations uh, of the United Kingdom and of the European Union. Uh, it is not an aspirational document or a policy document. Um, it, is a, it is an international treaty and it's binding both in international law as part of an international treaty and in domestic law as a result of Section 7A of the Withdrawal Agreement Act. It's unambiguous unambiguously legal in character and obligation. Um, it provides that EU law, not UK law, will apply to the regulation of goods, VAT, customs procedure, electricity, and state aid in full to Northern Ireland. Um, so those are EU rules, the rules of a foreign power provide, uh, applying in full to Northern Ireland. It provides some routes in some areas, not all, for the EU to grant exceptions to the application of those laws. And in particular, to the one Nigel referred to, the movement of goods could be goods which could be described as not at risk of moving into the Republic could be granted an exception from compliance with, with EU. Um, rules or payment of EU duties. But those exceptions are for the EU, to, for the UK to request and for the EU to grant. They are not automatic, neither are they uh, anything that the UK has the capacity to be able to um, demand. Uh, the protocol, as it interacts with other international and national legal obligations, is in a sort of very unusual and um, difficult, um, difficult position legally. But the first sort of issue of compliance the protocol has is in respect of Article 3, uh, Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights, the rights to free elections where people are able to choose their government. And since, since the protocol now no longer allows the people of Northern Ireland, either through elections to the Assembly or through elections to Westminster, to have any democratic say, whatever, over large swathes of economic, uh, over legislation governing economic life, and indeed tax through VAT and public spending, um, the protocol effectively exclude, it, it, you know, is in tension, shall we say, with um, Article 3, Protocol 1 of the European Convention of Human Rights. The protocol is also in tension 
at its most generous uh, with the Good Friday Agreement itself, in that it affects the constitutional status of Northern Ireland within the Union. Right? Um, and the suggestion it doesn't do so merely because it changes the economic characteristics of, of, um, of Northern Ireland's status in the Union and not its constitutional status is, I think, quite um, misleading, in fact, probably wrong. Right? Constitutions quite frequently have quite a lot to say about, um, about trade and about the movement of goods and products within, within the territory governed by that constitution. The US, commerce, US constitution has the commerce clause, um, our own act of union, which is subject to the litigation that um, Lord Dodds referred to. And of course, <coughs> the, the putative constitution for the European Union itself, although subsequently abandoned or replaced by the Treaty of Lisbon, also included very large chapters, uh, in fact, the entirety of the single market. So, so as a constitutional principle of the European Union. So the idea that merely it merely controls trade and is therefore not a constitutional question um, is uh, wrong, I think. And uh, of course, under the Good Friday Agreement, changes to the constitutional status of Northern Ireland need to be made with the consent of the people of, of Northern Ireland. And this is a change to the constitutional status, uh, in my view. Um, which doesn't, didn't meet that requirement of consent. Lastly, the protocol is, is in tension with, generously said again, um, as a, uh, with um, the, e, the Treaty of, um, uh, of the European Union itself, Article 50, on which, of course, the UK negotiated the withdrawal agreement of which the protocol forms part, um, is the legal basis for, uh, on the European Union side, that allows the European Union to enter into the withdrawal agreement. And the European Union is, on, is only allowed in that, under that legal basis to negotiate the exit of the member state, not to govern permanent relations with the, with the then third country uh, once, uh, once the UK has left. That's to be governed by other provisions of the treaty. Relationships with third countries are governed by other provisions. And in fact, this rationale, this reasoning was, the re was a lot of the justification for why the withdrawal negotiations were conducted in the way they were, so that withdrawal first trade agreement after we had left was was uh, was to to meet this limit this fact that Article 50 cannot be the legal basis for the future relationship, and yet of course now we're told that the protocol is the only solution and uh, and it is um, permanent. Um, so that's the, the final uh, legal problem with the protocol um, uh, with respect to the, the other international treaties in which it, in which it sits. The, the legal, that sort of legal picture, I think, um, su suggests that there are legal as well as political reasons for why the protocol needs to be uh, replaced. And my own view is that the protocol, um, it, one of the sort of best, if you, if you oppose the protocol, one of the sort of most effective ways to do so is in, in essence to say, well, the protocol was designed to solve a problem um, and it has, it has failed to do so. And so the, it can't anyway be permanent for the reasons that I've just described, um, leaving aside the political implications and the instability in Northern Ireland that it has resulted in. And, and so the sensible thing we have to do is to try something else. Um, and that need not carry with it any sort of loaded, um, or it need, need not carry with it any allegations of any bad faith or any um, failure to implement. It simply hasn't worked. It, was, it could never anyway be permanent and it needs to be replaced with something else. So with what? <laughs> and with what, uh, it's instructive, I think, to go back and think through the original problem the protocol was intended to solve, right? Because that problem is still there. It was always real and is still there. So the, the problem is that both, well, both the UK and the EU and both communities in Northern Ireland um, had agreed um, that 
no, uh, there should be no hard border, so no border with customs infrastructure and associated security installations should be reinstalled on the Northern Irish Republic border. Uh, and that was a point of vigorous agreement between everyone in the, in the process. And it, because that would, and it, it's, we should just think through why, right? Because customs border infrastructure is undesirable in, in its, it's disruptive to people's lives. Um, it also uh, would be vulnerable to, um, to attack from uh, Republican terrorists. And the security installations that would be required in no doubt to protect the customs infrastructure um, would be on the British side anyway, a clear, a, proper, a straightforward breach of the Good Friday Agreement, which did require the removal of British security installations from the border. So it's unambiguously that the first problem you have to solve is no customs border infrastructure on the border. Um, and the second problem we had to solve for was that uh, two sides, I suppose, are the same, a problem expressed in two ways, uh, which is that if you weren't going to have customs border infrastructure, how do you protect the single market on the EU side and the British internal market on our side um, from all of the things that customs borders are there to do? So collecting duties, smuggling, ensuring that your product safety standards are enforced, et cetera. So, you know, how do you solve for that problem? If you're not gonna have a border, which is going to be the first opportunity to assert your jurisdiction and check compliance with your laws, how are you going to, um, how are you going to protect the integrity of, of either side's legal system? And the protocol's answer, as we all know, was to say, well, we're just gonna put the border in the North, in the Irish, in the North Sea, that would be, that was uh, unfortunate at the time, in the, in the Irish Sea. Um, so, the alternative is to think more carefully. Mutual, what mutual enforcement is, is to say, well, no, let's think more carefully about the role of customs border and see whether or not we can think of a legal mechanism that allows you to protect the two markets without the presence of a border infrastructure. That's what mutual enforcement does. And how it works is that each side makes a reciprocal treaty enforce, reciprocal treaty commitment to enforce the rules of the other with respect to the trade in goods, right? which essentially means each side maintains autonomy and sovereignty over the content of their legal rules, but makes a commitment to enforce the rules of the other in respect of goods crossing the border. Right? So the, um, what that does in legal terms is it places the obligation to comply with um, the importing state's rules on the exporter. So as a matter of, in a, in a practical example, if you're exporting a sofa from Belfast to Galway, the exporter, as a matter of Northern Irish, British law, must comply with the product standards of the Republic and therefore the EU, and also pay any duties that are owed. And if they do not, they do not merely import it in breach of EU rules. The, the fact of exporting it is unlawful as a matter of British law as well too. Right? And this basic concept, which would apply mutually, uh, can be applied to any rule the importing state wishes to enforce at the border. There's an important exception to that, which we'll come back to if, if you're interested in relation to um, sanitary and phytosanitary controls. The solution, because it's you're relying on the, the integrity of the legal system of the other to enforce your rules. Um, the, uh, you don't need the customs border post, right? So rather than that being your first opportunity to enforce your laws and collect your duties, you are sort of, if you like, reaching beyond the border and the state, the exporting state is doing that job for you. What are the advantages of this versus the protocol? The first is that rights and obligations are in balance. Well, the, the protocol is fundamentally asymmetric. The United Kingdom is enforcing the laws of the European Union in respect of goods trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, that, that is asymmetric. That obligation goes one way only. Right? This solution is symmetric, which makes it inherently more um, stable and also more enforceable because each side is dependent upon the other. 
it removes the Irish sea border. The trade border now becomes uh, north-south. Um, and mutual enforcement has a much narrower goal. It simply operates to remove the customs border infrastructure that would otherwise be required north-south. It does not require any substantive harmonization of the rules. Um, it allows Northern Ireland to benefit from the same freedoms as the rest of Great Britain, especially in respect to those areas of the single market which have found their way into the Northern Ireland Protocol, especially in relation to um, state aid, which effectively controls uh, or prevents differential tax regimes for Northern Ireland um, and significant chunks of, of public spending. There are impacts for British sovereignty and brutally, any treaty involves impacts for sovereignty. That's what a treaty does. It, in, it involves agreeing to, a, um, to do something with your sovereignty. Uh, and in particular, this requires us, the UK, to enforce EU rules. We have to take EU rules and enforce them through our courts. But we are only doing so in respect of goods which are in any event crossing into the Republic of Ireland. Those goods in any event will have to pay Irish duties and will have to comply with Irish standards. We are simply moving the point of collection and checking to the British legal system and out of the Irish one in return for a reciprocal obligation going the other way. Now, this system does not exist anywhere in the world. It's a, it's a novel approach and it would require very significant degrees of mutual trust because that is what require, that is you are essentially trusting the other side to enforce um, your rules. And, and that would also, it would also require significant degrees of interaction because it's not just a case of enforcement, you also have to allow legitimate trade to pass um, freely. And so people on, in, in Northern Ireland must be able to conduct their lawful trade with the Republic easily and smoothly. Um, and so that would require HMRC to be able to access the customs databases of the EU so as to be able to know what the customs treatment of a product is so that someone can, someone can pay the duty. Of course, there aren't going to be much in the way of duties because we have a duty-free trade agreement now, but there would have to be mutual access to the data and there would also have to be auditing and information rights so as to build confidence in the system that each other have. That essentially is the, is the mutual enforcement approach and it's it's mutual and it, not asymmetric it's inherently more stable it respects northern ireland's uh, position in the united kingdom and it provides much higher levels of protection to the single market than the current system is doing right where um, there is no if if the great under the if a sausage were to appear at, were to cross the border and to were to appear in galway um, which, which hasn't happened as far as we know, but if, if, this, if the sausage, if the great sausage mystery were to happen, then the, um, you know, under mutual enforcement, that would, have been a, that would have been unlawful as a matter of British law. Right? Whereas what the EU has currently got is a complaint against the UK for failure to implement the withdrawal agreement properly, rather than a, um, rather than a direct right um, to, uh, under British law, to prevent that prevent that unlawful trade from occurring. So there are lots of more details I could go into, but I think that's probably enough for, that's enough for everyone uh, to be chewing on for the moment. Thank you very much indeed, James, for that very clear analysis. Um, now, I think Bernard Jenkins is, is going to leave us shortly. Um, his comments on aid for Scotland seem to have uh, uh, produced a flurry of questions most of which seem to think that the Scots are getting too good a financial deal. Um, I wonder if you could just talk a bit, a bit about this, Bernard, as to whether you think there should be some general reform of regional aid and aid to the devolved uh, regions uh, as a way of giving more rationale to changes in, in uh, aid to the various parties? Um, uh, the answer is yes, and such a reform is taking place through the creation of the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which it takes over the role of European Regional Structural Funds. 
And uh, whereas, uh, I mean, in fact, we're, we're kind of taking a leaf out of the European Union's book. Uh, we're saying, um, uh, you know, if we're going to support, uh, if the United Kingdom government's going to support different parts of the United Kingdom, the United Kingdom government should have more say in how that money is spent. And certainly the EU was, could be very prescriptive on how uh, its money was spent. Only, of course, in that case, it wasn't its money. It was our money in the first place. Um, the, then also needs to be more uh, accountability. I mean, there is a, a, um, a failure of accountability if the, um, uh, say, the Scottish government can simply take credit for what is being spent uh, by the United Kingdom government in, in Scotland. Uh, so the UK Shared Prosperity Fund and the Leveling Up Fund, and there will be other, uh, uh, there'll be other things will emerge, I imagine, like the city deals, um, which will, as I say, create this direct relationship between uh, the citizens of the whole of the United Kingdom and the United Kingdom uh, government. But finally, I would just add, I mean, it is very, um, it, it, it's very tempting to, to feel that, oh, this has all become too much. And of course, the Scottish Nationalist Party in particular specialises in being tiresome and unpleasant uh, to create an atmosphere amongst English voters and English MPs. Uh, we give them all this money and they're so ungrateful, why do we bother? Well, I'm afraid patience is a virtue uh, and we have to have patience. Uh, we have to start winning arguments in Scotland Wales uh, in a way that we haven't uh, bothered to before. And it's in our national interest to do so. The idea that breaking up the United Kingdom or allowing the United Kingdom to break up uh, would be in the interests of uh, English voters is one of the great illusions of the nationalist debate. Uh, England would be utterly diminished if Scotland broke away. Uh, when I was in Canada shortly after the 2014 uh, Scottish independence referendum, there was horror at what so nearly happened uh, because so many people who live in Canada uh, feel there are British heritage and Scottish heritage. And of course, uh, our, our influence around the world, it would be the end of our great island story. It would be the end of the image of the United Kingdom as a small but disproportionately powerful country with influence in security and, um, and trade that is disproportionate to our size. Uh, we really would, England would become much more just another country. And uh, there is a, one additional complication that I beg you to consider, which is that our nuclear deterrent is based in Scotland. Uh, when the uh, Glen Lyon uh, um, missile facility was rebuilt uh, a decade or so ago, it was one of the largest infrastructure projects in Europe. It was a vast project. The investment and the suitability of the, the um, Holy Loch and the Clyde for our nuclear deterrent is unparalleled anywhere in the United Kingdom. The cost of transferring our nuclear deterrent uh, would be possibly disproportionate. So add, add, and then we'd have to reopen the whole debate about whether we can afford a nuclear deterrent. And would we win that argument? Uh, so add to the loss of Scotland, the loss of our nuclear deterrent and all the loss of influence that that entails and the loss of deterrence and the additional instability in global politics as a result of the UK Withdraw, dismantling itself and then England having to withdraw largely from the Permanent Five on the UN Security Council as a leading member of NATO, all these things. So the breakup of the United Kingdom has huge, huge consequences which are avoidable and we should do our best to avoid them while making sure that the, the money uh, that we spent with Scotland, in Scotland is sent with good grace but is spent more accountably and transparently. Thank you very much for that comprehensive response, Bernard. Um, could I just now go to Lord Dodds? Um, I wonder, Nigel, if you could just say something about the timescales involved here. Um, these issues you rightly pointed out in your address uh, have been debated uh, in Parliament uh, and externally for a number of years, but do you feel there is now a, a real need for urgency in dealing with the issues of the Northern Ireland Protocol? Thank you, Barry. And um, I, remember, I remember saying um, 
that the matters concerning the protocol needed to be sorted out within uh, six weeks, but that was about three months ago. Mm -hmm. um, the fact of the matter is that it is beyond urgent. Um, we have these, um, as, as James said, and, and I thank him for the work that he's done on the mutual enforcement uh, concept and ideas, and we've discussed it um, previously, and I still think it remains a, a, an excellent solution to the problems that we face for the reasons that he has so eloquently outlined. Uh, but we, we have this problem now of uh, the, the exceptions that have been allowed in terms of grace periods running out. We have a grace period that expires at the end of June for chilled meats in the Northern Ireland. Um, bizarrely, we'll not be able to have chilled meat products from Britain <laughs> coming to Northern Ireland for, 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 for single market reasons. We have the imminent problems regarding medicines, uh, which again is an incredible situation where Northern Ireland may not be able to have access to uh, GB uh, medicines um, because they're not licensed or approved by the EU. Uh, we have problems in relation to goods coming to supermarkets. I think the expiry date is, is the end of September for those, if I remember rightly. So there's a, there's a number of immediate problems which will bite very, very hard on consumers. In other words, they will notice it straight away in a very real practical interference with their daily lives. Um, so the, 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 there is an urgency. Um, there's an urgency for political reasons. Um, everyone knows that the summer in Northern Ireland with the, uh, is always a time of heightened tensions. Um, and this year is, 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 is certainly uh, worse, I think, than in previous years. For instance, tonight in Newton Arts in County Down, there is going to be a, 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 a large outdoor assembly gathering of people to protest against the protocol. Uh, and whilst most, and then these have been going on nightly across Northern Ireland uh, for weeks, but there's always the potential at these kinds of events for trouble. You know, one never knows who, who, who might get involved for nefarious reasons or something spirals out of control um, and, and, and so on. So it's a tinderbox. And, and politically, it's destabilising the Northern Ireland Assembly as well. Um, unionism, it, it is not possible to move forward on many issues and, and do trade-offs when you have a massive one-sided anti-union uh, colossus hanging over the political process in Northern Ireland. Until that is removed, um, the room for manoeuvre on a whole range of issues is very limited because the unionist electorate will say, well, why are you moving on this? And yet you're not dealing with the biggest problem we've faced in decades in terms of the threat to the union. Mm. So like, like Bernard, I, I do pay tribute to Lord Frost. I think David Frost does understand. He's come to Northern Ireland and spoken to people at grassroots level in community, in communities, as well as business people. Um, I, I, I think that, uh, you know, he has, and, and, and other ministers have been making it clear how unsatisfactory the, the protocol is. Uh, what, what I would say is just a plea, and I've made this plea to David Frost and to the Prime Minister, is that when we do take action on the protocol, there is no point doing something that satisfies nobody. In other words, we annoy the people who think that the protocol should be implemented rigorously and we don't satisfy the fundamental flaws that exist as far as unionists are concerned. So we've got to do something, I think, uh, quite radical on it, which does alleviate the constitutional and trade uh, problems, but which people will see doesn't destabilise the Belfast Agreement because, as Bernard again said rightly, uh, that agreement, as amended with St Andrew's agreement and so on, should be the priority above everything else. And at the moment, we have an imbalance. It needs balance needs to be restored, and I think if balance is restored, there may be, you know, a week or two or a month or two of complaining uh, in certain quarters in Northern Ireland. But people will then see that nothing fundamentally has changed with the Belfast Agreement. So, 
I think um, it, time is very short. I, I think that is that is the message here. Yeah. yeah. Do you agree with that, Bernard? I do. I and I think that um, um, having um, listened to Lord Frost, uh, his evidence to the Select Committee this week, uh, it's evident that things are going to come to a head this summer. Uh, I'm not optimistic that the EU is going to compromise. I don't think the EU is capable of compromising. Uh, they are um, wedded to their doctrines. Uh, for one member state to sort of break ranks is a kind of heresy. Uh, the bureaucracy doesn't have a mandate to be flexible until all the member states agree. I think it is incapable of being flexible, and that's more or less been confirmed to me by a senior uh, EU diplomat in London this week. And uh, uh, if we therefore, uh, we may not unilaterally have to extend the grace periods, that would be a relief, but we're not going to resolve these problems just by extending grace periods. Um, I think the government has to develop the mutual enforcement proposal and the trusted trader proposals and table them as perfectly reasonable, superior solutions to maintaining the Good Friday Agreement, to maintaining peace in Northern Ireland, and to uh, respecting the integrity of the EU single market without having infrastructure on the border. All those things could be achieved, as uh, James very capably explained, and um, uh, we have to table these reasonably, patiently. We must not indulge in the uh, angry exchanges that uh, Mr. Macron was trying to provoke at the summit. And incidentally, it's quite evident to the British government that um, uh, uh, President Biden uh, was not as keen on uh, stirring up this issue in, in front of the G7 as one or two of his spokesmen indicated. And in the private discussions with, uh, with Boris Johnson, uh, this was not a point of major difference. Uh, they both want to work through together. I think President Biden is much more practical even though some of his supporters are trying to position him as some kind of proto-Irish nationalist. Uh, I think he wants to make this work. Um, and his name was taken in vain in one or two of the pre-summit briefings. So I think that's all basically very encouraging. But what we've got to remember is we have to carry our audience. And our audience, to a certain extent, it's the Irish Republic. Our audience is also uh, one or two of the other member states. It's, it's Switzerland, it's Canada, it's the United States outside the European Union. Uh, we've got to carry uh, the WTO with us. Um, uh, we, they've got to see that we are being reasonable and practical, uh, it, that it's the EU being intransigent. Uh, and um, uh, I, d I'm, I don't want to inflame the situation by even using the term intransigent. Let's just concentrate. On, and it's, uh, let's stop looking back. We must stop. I, I made this mistake on a television programme recently where somebody had to go ask why the situation was and I wanted to defend that and explain why they had been wrong at the time. Nobody's interested in looking backwards. Let the EU look backwards and say, this is what you've signed. Let us look forwards to how to resolve the problems that are emerging and stop talking about the past. We need to talk about the future, not the past. Okay, I, I take your points about the audience and persuading the audience, but um, on the other hand, you got the risk that the situation in Northern Ireland could, under certain circumstances, get out of control. And is that not the main priority at this time? Absolutely. Um, we've got to be utterly principled, but um, we need to be very clear and very firm in, in what we are doing and prepared to do. But we must be polite and courteous and as patient as possibly can with our European counterparts while we do it. But that doesn't rule out uh, invoking Article 16, which is after all a legal mechanism that's embedded in the protocol itself. And, um, and uh, ultimately we might have to resort to uh, international law, principles of international law that are beyond the adjudication process in the withdrawal treaty, which depends upon ultimate supremacy of the European Court of Justice. I mean, it was another fatal mistake that Theresa May made, uh, which, which Boris couldn't get out of, that you finish up with an international agreement where the European Court of Justice is the final arbiter uh, on which we are not represented. Mm. I mean, it's just ludicrous. We've got to discredit that if necessary. Uh, we've got to send the message around the world. We've left the EU, European sovereignty, EU sovereignty no longer applies in the UK. And as you said right at the beginning, uh, the EU is still trying to make a power grab over the sovereignty of the United Kingdom. One of the things that's been suggested to me this week is that we should consider a temporary alignment of 
all our product standards and um, food standards in the UK in order to obviate the need for checks between on goods between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, but of course, as soon as you agree temporary alignment, you're conceding the principle that they should decide what our food standards should be. They should decide what our, our goods standards should be. And we're not going to do that. They are still trying to take back control. I mean, mustn't let them. Quite right. Uh, James, have, have, have you got any comments on these points? Yeah, I mean, comments? the last comment that Bernard made is, is very, um, very important and, and very current, you know, because the, the alignment question, or the question of temporary alignment arises, especially in respect of um, what's called SPS checks. So, so checks on agri-food and, and um, uh, agricultural products. And here, the suggestion is that th there's nothing to lose in the UK essentially aligning in a Swiss style way. It's not actually quite clear what they mean by that because I don't think they actually want the Swiss agreement, which um, has a number of characteristics that the EU historically has, has disliked very strongly. So I expect when they say Swiss style, it wouldn't exactly be the Swiss agreement. Um, but where we, where we align until we don't want to align anymore and, um, and we will, we will then, you know, that that would remove a lot of the checks. And, you know, Bernard's right that, you know, in principle, it's very politically naive suggestion, given that the previous government collapsed on the basis that, you know, that's what the, that's what the UK wide backstop essentially was, right? Um, alignment with the, with the common market and, um, and the customs union. And, and the UK having entered into a thin trade agreement with the EU, on the basis of regaining sovereignty over our, our own um, laws and um, regulations, you know, is, is why would we why would we countenance that like three months later? I mean, essentially, having paid paid, there is an economic price associated with the increased trade barriers there are now with the single market. You know, we've made that decision, right? We've made that decision. So why in, why after six months would we would we go back on it? So I think it's very politically naive. Uh, and it also allows the EU to escape the underlying problem, right? The underlying problem that, that we have is that the, the protocol approach to, to protect the single market, essentially puts protection of the single market above the constitutional settlement in the Good Friday Agreement. And that protection of the single market is, um, is, ex is extreme, right? That's not an interpretation problem. That's actually a legal problem. That's what's in the agreement. It does say in the agreement that we're going to stop the supply of chilled meats from GB to NI. It's not an interpretation. That's not a surprise that happened later on. That's in there. <coughs> um, but it's, it's protecting the single market right, at the costs of the constitutional settlement in Northern Ireland. And so the, if you temporarily align, you effectively... You know, allow the EU to escape the consequences of that hierarchy, the decision to place the importance of the single market above the constitutional settlement in Northern Ireland. And I, I don't think that's appropriate either. Um, you know, now it is very urgent. The protocol hasn't worked. There are workable alternative solutions, and we need to talk about them. Um, temporary fixes are just that and aren't going to provide the stability that Northern Ireland desperately needs and is entitled to in its relationship, both with the you know, Republic and with the rest of the United Kingdom. Thank you, James. Uh, now I've got a question from uh, Anna Bailey. Uh, she says it's a question for James in particular. Uh, mutual enforcement is the obvious solution, but as Bernard has just said, the EU is incapable of flexibility. Given that enforcing the Northern Ireland Protocol is a legal requirement, is the better way forward to use Article 16 to make whatever easements we can or an act of parliament to override uh, the Northern Ireland protocol? Well, I, I, don't, I don't quite accept the premise of that. So, I mean, I, I've worked in Brussels and you know, for and against the European Union my whole life.
a, you know, from the EU's perspective, is a very significant concession because you are granting for the very first time the control of the protection of the single market frontier to a non-member state, right? Uh, you are allowing a non-member state the privileges of access to the single market. That was from the EU's perspective of where everyone starts. <laughs> uh, the privileges of access to the single market in return for none of the um, costs or that no, no budgetary contributions, uh, no MEPs, um, no commissioner, etc. And all, all of that involves a compromise um, of the European Union uh, legal order. Um, so I, I, I don't actually agree that the EU is incapable of, of compromise. And I think that the, what, what, the EU is in, what the EU, I think, finds very difficult to compromise is the fundamental legal structure of the single market. So I, I don't think the EU can compromise on granting the UK or any you know, free access to the single market without the institutional and legal architecture that, that, that has built that, that single market. I think those two are in fundamental distinction, right? But the, the mutual enforcement um, proposal would take Northern Ireland and out of the customs union of the single market. And this has a much, much more narrow goal than the protocol itself. The protocol is essentially to create sort of de facto single market membership for Northern Ireland in respect of goods. Right? Um, this is, this is has a much mutual enforcement has a much more modest goal, uh, and is simply about the manner in which the rules of the single market are enforced at the border, not changing those rules, but, you know, but the manner in which they are enforced. And so, given that the protocol itself changed the manner in which those rules are enforced, essentially delegated them to a third state, right? Though it doesn't seem to me impossible to yeah, yeah. a different revision to the manner in which those rules are enforced um so that that would be it's a slightly long answer but but i uh, to, to that question I'm... i think you've broken up there james i i'm just going to switch to bernard because i know bernard's got to leave have, have you any views on the, this question that anna Bailey's put forward um seems to I, I certainly think we should try everything um and uh within the protocol as well as well as uh, um, we should only leave you know, threatened to overturn the protocol. Article 16 is within the protocol. I don't know how long the legal processes of, uh, for the EU to review any Article 16 actions would take, um, but it would be part of a negotiation. The, re the, uh, the reason I raised my hand is because I think we've got to be realistic, James, that um, so far, everything that the EU have done uh, since the Brexit vote, I have underestimated their determination to be intransigent and bullying and to the detriment of their own consumers and their own national interests because they are defending a, a, an indefensible construct. And the single market actually is an indefensible construct. It's a, it's a protectionist construct and it's, uh, it's designed to create central power in the Commission uh, as its primary objective is not actually designed to serve consumers and it uh, it serves it it, it it is a bargain with producers rather than consumers and it's certainly not democratic and um, uh, I thought that the EU would find it um, much harder to resist doing a sensible free trade agreement they've refused to do one uh, we've got zero tariffs on goods but all the, all, almost the almost the rest of the agreement is almost hardly worth having. And if they start getting into a tip for track trade war, I think we begin to ask the question, why are we bothering with this trade and cooperation agreement? Because um, uh, if we can't, start, if they start applying tariffs against our goods, which they're allowed to do under the agreement, uh, if, they, if, they, if they disagree with our, if the court disagrees with the application of Article 16, we're in very big territory. So what I'm saying is, I think they're very incapable of being flexible. I think it's very difficult for them to be flexible. It's not, they don't consider it to be in their interest to be flexible because they have to prove to every other member state that you can't leave the EU without being damaged. And I think we have to be psychologically prepared to face very considerable escalation of this dispute if we want them to be flexible. So I just think we need to get ourselves into that frame of mind. Thank you very much for that contribution. And uh, 
all of what, what you have uh, advocated today, Bernard. Uh, thank you indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, Goodbye, everyone. A brilliant and a great privilege to be on the panel with, the, with all of you. Thank you so much. And thank you, audience. Bye-bye. Bye. Nigel. Um, Nigel, would you like to come in on this, this question that Anna Bailey has raised? Yeah, look, I mean, I think that uh, it's a very, very good question of MSA. So in the sense of, do you try to go for the maximum uh, within the parameters of the protocol, including Article 16? Uh, you can do an awful lot by triggering Article 16. However, uh, if it's followed um, in the way that, it, that it's set out, it does lead to a further negotiation and there's, there's issues about how proportionate things have to be and so on. So in my view, it, it isn't a permanent solution. It's another means of, of, of you know, easing uh, what is a fundamentally flawed construct. Um, it doesn't do away with the direct application of EU laws. Uh, you know, it can, it can mitigate some of the ways in which those laws are policed and checks and so on and so forth, and maybe even a bit further. But that's why we, we supported very much the, the amendments um, or the proposals that the government tabled in the United Kingdom Internal Market Bill before before Christmas uh, uh, and, and the decision to withdraw those, okay, albeit in the face of a lot of opposition in, in the House of Lords and, and uh, elsewhere. I, I think that um, th th those provisions did allow for the UK to um, override more fundamentally aspects of the, uh, of the protocol. Um, the decision was taken not to proceed. Again, it was in the context of wider considerations. But, uh, and then this gives rise to another point that I will make, at a, you know, in relation to the previous question about tensions in Northern Ireland. There is a feeling in Northern Ireland that whenever, uh, you know, wider trade issues are concerned, the UK on the global stage, negotiations, that Northern Ireland um, interests come very much down the uh, down, down down the pegging order, and I mean pegging order, and that we are left sort of high and dry, quite frankly. And uh, the fundamental duty of any government is to protect the union. In my case, I strongly agree with what Bernard said about the detriment to uh, you know England and to the United Kingdom of Scotland were to leave, and, and Northern Ireland unionists feel at times that that fundamental responsibility of protecting the union is not being respected in the way it should. So look, my preference would be for um, legislation in the House of Commons, in Parliament, to override uh, the protocol and take back proper control and sovereignty. Uh, and I think Bernard's right. I think this will, uh, could potentially escalate um, quite considerably. Um, you know, and I think, you know, if, if I'm not convinced the EU will show any flexibility, as James says, they can if they wish, but there's such political pressure from the Irish in particular not to show that flexibility, much um, as much as it is against their interests, mind you, but they're, they're completely uh, fixated now on a Brussels-centric uh, policy as opposed to one which is based on close relationships with, with London, which is very much more in their interest in terms of trade and their economy, but they've abandoned that in favour of this more ideological approach. Uh, and and uh, so Brussels is under considerable pressure from the Irish uh, not to compromise in, in the way that needs to be done to, to make progress. Thank you very much, Nigel. Um, James, have you... you you any final thoughts that you'd like to feed in to sort of wrap this up? Well, I, th I think there's a couple of a couple of points. I mean, as, as a the, the lawyerly points rather than political points. The, the first is that Sir Bernard is right that Article 16 is within the protocol, um, so at activating it is not a breach of the protocol as long as you do so and follow its terms, which do require you know 
prior notice to the to the European Commission and to ensure that whatever measures that you take are proportionate and are time limited, et cetera, and have to protect the operation of the protocols as much as possible. So, you know, that's Nigel's point really, which is that, you know, the Article 16 is not a kind of magic get out of jail free card. Um, it would it would leave the political in place. And in fact, any, any steps taken under Article 16 would have to be um, chosen so as to minimize their impact on the protocol. I think the other, the next second legal point is that any step to use Article 16 would immediately face litigation, um, probably domestically in the United Kingdom under the um, under the Withdrawal Act, and also um, and also using the dispute resolution mechanisms of the um, of the withdrawal agreement. So. You know, the UK does not want, I expect, to be in a position where it is going to lose either of those, um, you know, litigation in either of those fora. So any use of Article 16 has to be done, you know, very, uh, very, very calmly and with very clear sense of what the evidence is, what the steps are that, you know, are proportionate and consistent with the provisions that comply with all of the notice provisions, etc. Um, because otherwise you will you will lose right in court, which is actually worse, uh, I, I would I would say for the UK. And then the third legal point is that you know the the European Union's position is that the EU the UK has signed this agreement as a as an international treaty, and they are right about that. Right? And so when we talk about their inflexibility, um, you know they they are um, entitled frankly, to say that the UK has agreed this um, only very, very recently, right? That, that, is, that is a legitimate view. <laughs> um, and that's why I say, my, in my, my um, view, is that you can't escape the le that legal reality you know, where I started my remarks. And um, it is better to say, um, we do have these legal obligations, absolutely. We're not trying to escape them. We're trying to comply with them but um, they are not working. Right? They're not working to achieve their underlying political goals. And in that context, we all have a responsibility. That all, nor, uh, the European Union now has essentially co-guarantor responsibility for peace in Northern Ireland as a result of the withdrawal agreement. You know, we all have a responsibility to design something that works better. Right? And um, that's the sort of way I would like uh, the United Kingdom to present this, um, rather than unilateral actions which might expose us to, to legal challenge. Well, thank you very much indeed. This has been a fascinating 90-minute discussion that we've had. Uh, I, I'd like to really thank Nigel and James for the unique contributions that they've given from their expertise and experience, and we've all gained enormously, I feel, from this session. And as far as the Bruges Group members are concerned, I know that literally thousands of you are watching this and following this on Facebook. And uh, I think you've really had great value for money this afternoon. Thank you very much to our speakers. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Thank you.